Hello and welcome. My name is Judy Dumont, Director of the Massachusetts Broadband Institute. Hi, I'm Tim Scott with Axia NG Networks USA. This is the first in what we expect to be a series of shows dedicated to all things broadband in Western Mass. Today we would like to talk to you about who we are, what we're doing as it relates to broadband, how we're doing it, and why broadband is important to you. As you may or may not know, we are building a thousand mile fiber optic network throughout Western Mass, named Axia Mass Broadband 123. The Massachusetts Broadband Institute was created by Governor Patrick and the legislature to close the digital divide in Massachusetts. And there are three key building blocks to doing this. First, it's extending the broadband infrastructure to those communities that don't have full coverage today. And those are mostly here in Western Mass. Second, it's making sure all homes, businesses, and institutions have that access to high-speed internet technology. And third, it's making sure all citizens know the importance of broadband. And we know that 30% of all Americans today choose not to subscribe to broadband. And the number one reason is they say it's not relevant in their lives. And we need to make sure that we provide them the training and the tools that they need so they can understand how valuable this tool is. Today we'll focus on the first two building blocks. We received federal stimulus funding on June 30th of 2010 to build a fiber optic middle mile network. That's really what you would consider a backbone. And that's the first block. And that will connect over 1,300 schools, libraries, police and fire stations, and other community buildings. The Mass Broadband Institute is an economic development agency. And as such, we are not in the position to be the network operator. So we actually hired Axia to operate and maintain the network for us. Tim, will you tell us a little bit about Axia and, and the role that you'll play on this network? Sure, thanks Judy. Axia engages typically on a global basis with forward-looking government uh, to assist in finding an answer to their broadband policy objectives. And we've done this all around the world. One of our first initiatives was in Alberta, Canada, where we worked with the government to build a new fiber infrastructure to connect many rural towns that simply didn't have broadband and had no choice of providers within their communities. We've also exported a similar solution to France, where we have 16 regional networks built around France. Uh, we've done, uh, we're in the middle of a rollout in Singapore, which will bring fiber to every premise in Singapore. And we have a small initiative in Spain, and that brings us today to our initiative here in Massachusetts. In all cases, when we engage with these governments at a provincial, state, or national level, we become the long-term operator of the new fiber infrastructure that gets built and that's the case here in Western Mass. A, a very clear distinction that we like to make in our business model and our approach is that we're a wholesale only operator of the network. And what does that mean? That we don't offer any retail services on this infrastructure as one of our principles is we believe that we shouldn't compete with our customers and the customers of this network, just like our other networks around the world, are retail service providers. I think the best way to think of that wholesale example is to think of a regional airport. Often a regional airport receives state or federal funding to build the infrastructure and actually build the airport. Then the airport seeks a private entity, a private company to operate the airport and bring their expertise to their daily operations. And then the private sector is asked to compete to offer services at the airport to transport people from point A to point B. And we take a very similar approach to how we believe the best telecommunications infrastructures can be built. So what is Axia's business? Axia's business is actually the complexity of running these fiber networks, which we do on behalf of the governments that we engage with. And that means taking care of all operational complexities, all the OPEX issues, making sure the right electronics are deployed, that they're maintained appropriately. And we do this to ensure that we can always apply the latest in what's called next generation network technologies across these fiber infrastructures. In the case of Massachusetts, Axia com competed through a public procurement process that was set up by the Massachusetts Broadband Institute and we were selected as the long-term operator for the network initiative which is now called the Axia Mass Broadband 123 Network. Axia is excited to be here in Massachusetts 
Uh, we've set up our uh, regional office here in Massachusetts. We've hired locally and created a team of uh, professionals that will help and focus on building this network infrastructure over the next 16 months. I really like the airport analogy. Uh, I think it makes it really clear um, how to, uh, to distinguish between what wholesale is in a, a telecommunications network and what the retail providers are. We'll have to keep using that. Um, uh, we thought we should do uh, a level set here and make sure everyone understands a bit about fiber optic networks. We talk an awful lot about them, but I'm not sure everybody really understands what's the big deal about them, why uh, this network is different than traditional networks, and, and what this is going to bring to the community. So, Tim, I'm hoping you're up for the challenge and can uh, talk a little tech for us. Okay, I'm going to try, Judy. <laughs> Uh, so what we're building here in Massachusetts is an aerial fiber network. It's about 1,100 miles of new fiber that's going to be deployed up across the poles of western and north central Mass, and that's over 30,000 poles. So the question is, well, why fiber, and what's the big deal about fiber infrastructure? Fiber was first developed in the 1970s, and fiber communications have revolutionized the telecommunications industry and played a major role in the advent of today's information age that we're all very familiar with. Fiber also has a huge throughput or bandwidth capacity. The capacity of fiber is measured by the number of bits sent through or transported per second. Megabits, which is a million bits per second, were transported on the early fiber networks. But today, on next generation networks, like what we're building in Western Massachusetts, capacity can be measured in gigabits, which is a billion bits per second. So we'll see speeds here in Massachusetts on this new network of in excess of 10 gigabits per, uh, per second. And that's huge bandwidth capacity, which simply has not been available here before. So ultimately, this fiber network offers significantly more bandwidth capacity than the copper, cable, or satellite connections that may connect your home, business, or community anchor institutions today uh, in Massachusetts. So simply put, to keep things simple, Judy, with fiber, three episodes of your favorite TV show could be easily tra transmitted in under one second of information by using a fiber network. And I'm sure everybody's dying to know, Judy, what is your favorite television show? It's this show, of course, Tim. Of course. <laughs> so, Judy, Axia is confident, you're confident that, we're, that this is the right long-term investment for Massachusetts, that this fiber technology that is being deployed is future-proofed and we'll be using it for many, many decades to come. An estimated 35 million miles of fiber cover the globe today. But we know that not much of this exists in Western Mass, and that's one of the problems that we're trying to fix with this initiative, is to bring that fiber and make it available here in Western Massachusetts. The other area that we're addressing is what's known as dark fiber versus lit fiber. That's when we add the electronics to it. We add electronics to fiber, we turn it into a lit service, and that's the fundamentals for what is called a next generation network or an intelligent network. And that's what we're building with the Axia Mass Broadband 123 initiative. And next generation infrastructure with these electronics added on that infrastructure or a middle mile fiber network that's going to connect 1,300 buildings and connect over 120 towns. So Judy, would you like to explain the difference between middle mile and the funding that the MBI received um, that they got to build this network versus what is often called last mile? Sure, absolutely, and I think it's a really important element for people to understand. Uh, the mission of the Mass Broadband Institute is to connect the unconnected, and in order to do that, there are several components that are made up in building that network. Uh, as I mentioned, the first component is building the infrastructure or middle mile, and that part of the network is very much like the, the road system where the uh, middle mile could be considered the highway. It doesn't actually connect you to your home, but it's an important critical infrastructure to get the job done. Last mile is actually taking, um, building the, the network off of the middle mile or infrastructure and building those links that connect to the homes or, or businesses. And those links can be accomplished in a number of different ways. Today, it's accomplished uh, most often using copper. That's how when you pick up your 
your phone uh, line, uh, that's how that service is delivered over a copper wire. Uh, today, DSL um, is a broadband technology that gets delivered over copper. Um, there are other ways in which to do that as well. Uh, there are sometimes wireless can be used to deliver uh, broadband to homes or residences. And then finally, fiber to the home is the most up and coming. It's also the most expensive technology, um, but that is taking the connection from the middle mile network and building it out to get it the fiber connection into the premise. And as I said, there's lots of different ways to, to finish that last mile. Um, and that's certainly something that we're going to work on. But the Mass Broadband 123 project is, in fact, a middle mile project. Okay. And we've seen globally that these next generation networks can be truly transformational to the regions and areas that take an op the opportunity to leverage that capacity and that performance of these fiber networks. But what I think is important for the people who are watching us today is, un is to understand how these networks can transform many aspects of our daily lives. And we've prepared a video to show what can be done with these next generation networks. It's amazing how far we've come. From a letter, to a telegram, to a phone call, to an email, and beyond. Something within us drives the need to stay connected. Next generation networks are like a multitude of invisible threads closing the distance between one another. They allow us to connect with each other and with our world in ways that we are just beginning to imagine. Don't believe me? Let me show you. When my son Matthew was assigned a project on his favorite dinosaur for science class, he was able to access a wealth of interactive information, all because his school was connected to a next generation network. Using the network, he and his class were able to take part in a virtual dig for prehistoric creatures. My sister Melissa fell in love with a small town boy a couple of years ago. They just got married this spring. Now, I didn't think anything could pull her out of the big city, but he did. And now they live in a small rural town. She makes the most amazing jewelry. But when she started to plan the move, she was worried that she would lose the personal contact with her customers and that business would dwindle. Not wanting Melissa to give up her dream, her husband signed up with their local internet service provider, who uses a next generation network to provide high speed broadband services to the community. With access made possible by a next generation network, Melissa now does business through her online jewelry store with customers from around the world. My dad hadn't been into the city in years. He always said if it was anything really important, they'd bring it to him, until he was diagnosed with an acute heart condition. After his surgery, we were concerned that he might not be able to make it into the city every time he needed a follow-up appointment. But because our local medical clinic is connected to a next generation network, dad can go to his family doctor and connect with his specialists in the city using high definition video conferencing. My husband, Adam, now runs the farm that's been in our family for generations. And he's been exploring new ways to use technology to stay competitive in today's global market, including the possibilities of next generation networks. When he began exploring the capabilities of the network, he found that he could manage the business and connect with customers and suppliers in a whole new way. For example, Using sensors and other equipment installed inside our grain silos, Adam can monitor and manage the conditions inside to ensure our product is world-class. Then he can share that information with potential customers using face-to-face -face video conferencing while he shows them our entire quality management process. How do I use a next-generation network? I work as a first response team dispatcher for rural communities. With access to this network, I can help the teams in a critical way. 
The connectivity allows me to coordinate quickly and efficiently, providing maps and data as to what type of emergency they're responding to can be the difference that saves a life. What will you do with your next generation network? I hope you found that video as promising as I do. I get really excited when I think about the possibilities of change and transformation that we can bring to Western Mass. And we are committed to working with the regional leaders to bring these services and applications to Western Mass. One of the things that I'm uh, particularly interested in is how I think it can transform healthcare under a number of different ways, but one in particular is remote diagnosis. And that's where uh, folks who today have to travel great distances to get uh, the benefit of experts at regional hospitals or hospitals in Boston, now with uh, connecting through this network, they can receive diagnosis sitting in their local doctor's office and work with those, those regional doctors, maybe in the Springfield or Northampton um, uh, hospitals, or those certainly in Boston and quite frankly, anywhere in the world. And, and I really think you know, it takes the, the, the globe and, and shrinks it down, and especially as it relates to healthcare. I think we've all met people who have had to travel those great distances to get to a specialist. And, it's inc inconvenient, it's costly, and this network can ha uh, greatly reduce both of those. Absolutely, Judy, I would agree. And, and certainly we've seen globally that healthcare would be one of the biggest and early adopters of these fiber-based technologies and can really leverage the capability and capacity of these networks. The other interesting sector where we've seen a large uptake on fiber-based technologies is education. Mm -hmm. Uh, many schools on our provincial network across the province of Alberta are all moving towards 100 megabits of capacity to the school and several reports have come out recently indicating that they believe many uh, medium-sized schools will need capacity of at least one gigabit by 2017-2018 time frame and one of the drivers for that is, is coping and accommodating for student-owned devices that are now brought on into the into the educational and school environments. It really does transform the way <coughs> Uh, education is is done uh, all over the world. So now we thought it was important. We hopefully got you excited about what's coming and what's possible. So we thought we would spend a little bit of time talking about the status of the uh, Mass Broadband 123 project. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a federal grant, and we were awarded the grant on June 30th of 2010, and we were given three years to complete the project. So as the day of this taping, which is May 30th, 2012, we actually have 397 days left to complete the project. And my project team will laugh that I'm saying that because it's my mantra and everybody always will tell me how many days are left in the project. And it's really important for us to you know, keep our eye on the, the ball because we want to make sure we complete it within that time frame, but sooner if possible. And at this point, we're on track for, to complete the project. Um, one of the key areas of the project is something we call make ready work. And this comes about by the fact that it's an aerial build on 32,000 um, uh, utility poles. We need to get permission to get on those utility poles and they are owned today by Verizon and National Grid and Western Mass Electric. And so before they can license us and say go ahead and get up on those poles, they need to make sure that there's room. Um, and it's a very complex process and it's based on the National Electric Safety Code. Um, so they first need to survey all the poles and make sure that there's room for us to get on the pole. If there's not room for us to get on the pole, they do uh, an estimate on what it's gonna take to do the work to make room for us. And that work is called Make Ready Work. And it's a multi-step multi-organizational process and if you've ever seen uh, or come to any one of the community meetings you'll know I love to talk about utility poles. <laughs> um, so that work is moving along at a good pace and as of this week we have applied for a hundred percent of all the poles that we expect to be on um, for this network and paid for over 75 percent of the make ready work which you have to do in advance. Um, once they finish the work, uh, then they give us a license and it can be released to construction. Uh, so as of today, 
Um, 135 miles out of the 1,100 miles have been released to construction, and 43 miles of fiber has been built along the stretch between uh, Springfield to Great Barrington. Uh, over the summer, we lost a little bit of time as a result of all the weather events that we're also familiar with here, but because we had a, a, a very mild winter, we were able to make up that time. Another key area to, is connecting the community institutions that I talked about. This involves bringing fiber into the building, either aerially or underground, and installing the electronic equipment in the building. Um, and we're on track with these installations as well. Um, as of today, 94% of all buildings, such as schools and libraries, have been surveyed, inspected, and have a design uh, drawn out for them, uh, which is important because then when we send out the installation team, they know exactly where things are going and how it's going, going to be laid out. And 19% of those uh, institutions have already had their equipment installed. Hmm. And the sheer number of buildings and institutions that we're connecting required us to start that process in January of 2012 in order to get them all installed and up and running by next June. So it's a, it's a big project. The network will become operational in phases during the first half of 2013. And um, the exact dates aren't known yet because we're still waiting to get the information back from the poll owners as, as to when they will complete their work. But um, if you'd like to track our progress, you can do so by visiting the website at cmsbroadband123.com. And that will show by phase, um, you know, all the towns that are in a particular phase, uh, the progress that's been made, and what the estimated target date for when the, the network will be operational. So uh, please check that, that out. So it's going to be another very busy year for the MBI and our project team as we race to the finish. Uh, the construction companies have started to ramp up their crews, and the pole owners already have multiple crews in the field. So. Uh, you've probably already seen the, the trucks out along the highways, especially in the southern Berkshires, but by the summer they'll be throughout the, the project uh, area here in western Mass and north central Mass. And so, you know, give a toot if you're uh, on your way to Agawam to Six Flags for your summer vacation, because uh, the teams are going to be uh, working throughout the summer to get this done. And we'll continue the installation of the equipment in those institutions, as well as building out the mini data centers that we need as part of this network, really all through this year and into, into the beginning part of next year. So Tim, how have you been spending your time over the past year and what do you see upcoming? Well, thanks Judy. Uh, certainly Axia has been very busy as well, uh, working on essentially <laughs> getting ready for full network readiness in the summer of 2013 when the, the majority of this infrastructure will be built. Um, one of our key uh, roles has been ensuring that this next generation that gets built is going to be sustainable over the long term. And what we mean by that is by ensuring that it's both designed and built correctly to help facilitate further extensions to the network over and above the 1,300 buildings that you're directly c connecting with the Axiom Mass Broadband Initiative. Uh, one thing that's very important in our business relationship is that Axie inherits all those operational complexities of running this network. Very happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> so because of that arrangement and that agreement that we have, we want to make sure that we get it right. As we inherit those costs, we inherit those, those responsibilities. So that's a big part of our daily focus as the network is getting built uh, at the moment. As mentioned earlier, our core customers are the service providers that will actually use this network infrastructure. So over the last 12 months, we've had a strong outreach effort to regional, local service providers, explaining them the benefits of this network and this new infrastructure and who will be connected. And that's resulted in us signing up 22 service providers as of today who have signed and executed agreements to use this network infrastructure. These service providers will buy wholesale bandwidth products from Axia and then retail those services within the local market. So Tim, the service providers will be Axia's customers. So who are the service providers' customers? I just want to make sure I understand this. 
Yes, it's rather complex and a, and a little different, but correct. The service providers are acting as customers. Those are the customers that we support on this networks with the right agreements, the right service level agreements, for instance. And the service providers' customers, they will serve the buildings that you're connecting, those 1,300 buildings, and they'll also be using this infrastructure to ultimately serve businesses and residents off the Massachusetts broadband infrastructure. Great. So that progress, 22 service providers, is really quite exciting when you realize that we only have a small part of the network actually available today, which is essentially the I-91 corridor, the connection to One Federal in Springfield, and our transport service back to Boston. These uh, 22 service providers that we've signed up are a diverse range of providers, everybody from small local uh, players uh, here in, in the Western Mass market to national multi-billion dollar uh, service providers that are going to use this infrastructure as well. So a real diverse range within, within those 22 providers. One thing that Axia is very excited about is there's been an economic development impact for the stimulus funding that you receive to build this infrastructure mm -hmm. and we certainly believe over the short term as the network gets built that we'll see that economic development imp impact. But where we believe that this infrastructure and its openness and having these 22 providers which we expect to grow significantly over the years ahead, we believe that that also has a, has a huge long term economic development impact as both new market entrants, new companies will be created and this infrastructure can help sustain those existing providers that are here today in the, in the New England region. So Judy, we talked about how to consider this new network along the lines of an interstate system. Well, a key piece of the Massachusetts interstate system is having both the Mass Pike and I-91 actually interconnect. And what's important is that the Mass Pike transports you to and from the Boston market. That same principle can be applied from a network perspective and what we're building here in Western Massachusetts. It's just as important. From a regional gateway in one federal at Springfield, we have a, a range of solutions that can transport our service provider customers to the key competitive intermar internet market that exists in Boston. And that's a very, very important piece for all our service providers to know that they have compelling pricing that can actually now take them from one federal in Springfield back to that Boston market. This is really important because we've heard from many service providers that the rates that they were paying today have really been a, a hindrance for them forming a business in Western Mass and or growing a business. And that's one of the reasons why there's so much of the uh, area that's still unserved right. and why we're really hopeful that we can change the, the economic dynamics and, and allow these um, service providers to come in and offer services. Yeah, exactly. And we have seen, Judy, that uh, through this new transfer transport service, we've been able to cut some of those service providers' costs to provide better internet services in the market by more than half. Yeah, that's great. So hopefully you have a better understanding of uh, what we're building and why we're doing it. Um, and it's important to understand that that really is only the first phase of the mission of the Mass Broadband Institute, uh, which is to connect the unconnected. This is the first phase that will build that much needed infrastructure and connect the community institutions with bandwidth mm -hmm. an average of 10 times of what they're getting today. And so, Tim, I, I think we're, we're out of time. I know there's a lot of work to be done um, as we relate, and we'll talk more about it in upcoming shows about the last mile, uh, last mile work that we want to do, how to connect those, uh, the residences and, and the businesses. And um, so I, we look forward to that. And I... Uh, I've had, I've had a good time. I know uh, we're getting the cue that we're out of time. So uh, thanks very much for joining me on this, and uh, I appreciate it. I hope you'll tune in next time for more information. Thanks. Thanks very much.